Hey, this is Jeff, and we need to talk. In episode 5, we showed why the one-dimensional model of political thought is misleading, and introduced the two-dimensional model. In episode 6, we discussed nonarchy, and developed a graph demonstrating the sweet spot of state authority, the minimum required to prevent the worst that people would do to each other, but not enough to do significant harm to the people itself. Today, I want to dig just a bit deeper into that graph, and then talk about concrete steps we can all take to reduce oppression and maximize liberty. So, real quick, a couple observations on this graph. Last time, I used a few examples of harm done by individuals versus harm done by the state. But the yellow line is where it is because of harm done by non-state groups gangs, corporations, and so on. It excludes harm done by private groups in which the state is complicit. For example, slavery is sometimes practiced directly by governments, but even when it's administered by the private sector, it couldn't happen without the consent, support, and most importantly, the force of arms of the state. And that's reflected in the red line. So when it comes to pure group on individual harm, exclusive of state complicity, the worst industrial tragedy in history, the 1984 Union Carbide disaster in Bhopal, India, killed up to 8,000 people. The official figure is less than half that, but even if you assume the high-end estimate is correct, that's about how many civilians the Nazis murdered every single day during the Holocaust. And if you believe the company, which not many people do, sabotage was involved. But whether the cause was malice or negligence, that's the worst-case scenario for group-on-individual harm. If I was only counting individual-on-individual harm, you wouldn't even be able to see the yellow line on the same scale as state-on-individual harm. Another observation is that at first glance, the graph seems to ignore any benefits a state provides. But it doesn't. One purpose of a state is preventing people from harming each other, which is inherent in the slope of the yellow line. Another purpose is investing in infrastructure and providing a social safety net, all of which increases common prosperity and reduces the incentive for individuals to harm each other, and that's also reflected in the slope of the yellow line. On the other hand, the yellow line does not reflect the benefits provided by groups or individuals to each other. Not only does that mean that in reality the yellow line is probably lower than where I placed it, But in theory, it could actually be inverted if more people treated each other fairly. And I mean literally inverted, because the more power the state takes, the less power people retain to help each other. The final, and some might say most important function of the state, is national defense. And that's fair. The biggest threat to the life, liberty, and happiness of the people in any nation is the government of that nation. But second place goes to the governments of other nations. In the absence of a state, our only protection against despotic foreign aggression would be militias and mercenaries. Until we achieve global nonarchy, if there's a justification for government to exist, that's probably it. So how does this relate to specific political action? In episode 5, we saw that the traditional left-right spectrum is virtually meaningless by mapping it onto the two-dimensional model. But what happens if we map the oppressive authority of the state onto the same model? It becomes the opposite diagonal exactly perpendicular to the traditional one-dimensional model of left and right, and much more descriptive. Of course, it's backwards from the authority versus harm graph, with maximum oppression in the southwest corner and maximum liberty in the northeast corner. But unsurprisingly, at least to me, the minimum harm sweet spot is firmly in the northeast quadrant. How do we get there? I'll start with the most realistic ideas and then get into the aspirational stuff. Two things you have direct control over. First, treat each other the way you'd like to be treated. The more enlightened we are, the more we lower that yellow line, and the farther left we shift the sweet spot. And I don't mean tell people what they want to hear. Tell them what they need to hear, but do it with a little bit of compassion and understanding that they believe what they believe for a reason, even if the reason is that they've been misled or misinformed. Don't berate. Educate. The other thing you directly control is your vote. Nobody likes to feel like they've been played, so most people go all in on their last bet. But we've seen that the left-right lie is dragging us all into the southwest quadrant where nobody except the people dragging us there want us to be. Vote against the incumbent. Every office, every election, until they get it. That they are our representatives, not our overlords. If you just can't stomach the major party candidate who's running against the person already in office, then you need to get over the third parties never win thing. Third parties do win, not many at the national level yet, but in state and local elections they do all the time. And that's where national players come from. 
If you lean toward the northwest quadrant, there's the Green Party. If you prefer the southeast quadrant, there's the Reform Party. And the Libertarian Party is firmly in the northeast quadrant, and pretty much square on the minimum harm sweet spot of the authority versus liberty line. And there are obviously others. But what matters is, don't let any politician ever become entrenched in their office. The way things stand today, of all the attributes that should disqualify a person from public office, top of the list is the desire to hold public office. If they ever get it, how will we know? Well, now we're getting into the feasible but might take a while category. There's this frequent internet hoax about the 28th Amendment, about imposing term limits for Congress, which, while it's never actually been formally proposed by Congress, much less sent to the states for ratification, would be a great idea if it was. So if and when they accept term limits, it might be a sign that it wouldn't be a complete waste of time to reevaluate their sincerity. Another feasible but might take a while idea is reforming the Electoral College. I know, that sounds like a sore loser thing. But when states first began allocating electors in the winner-take-all party ticket manner that most of them still use today, the Founding Fathers thought that was an abomination. Maine and Nebraska are the only two states that still allocate electors the way the Founding Fathers envisioned. But a constitutional amendment could require all states to do the same. So let's get into the aspirational ideas. The Senate was structured with two seats per state, so large or heavily urbanized states couldn't totally steamroll small or mostly rural states. And that's a good thing, but the House of Representatives could use some work. I've toyed with the idea of making like jury duty. You get called at random, you serve a term in office. Except, I'm guessing a salary in the neighborhood of $175,000 a year wouldn't be the burden for most people that missing work for jury duty is. And I'm also guessing they'd do a better job of representing us. But it might be an even better idea to cut out the middlemen entirely and go with actual pure democracy, as long as it's not a simple majority, the 51% oppressing the other 49 thing. If you can't get two-thirds of the people behind an idea, or even three-quarters, then no. Everything that really needs to be legally mandated, don't murder, don't steal, and so on, should get unanimous approval. And there's another word for a democracy in which an ethical code of conduct is agreed upon by unanimous consent. That word is nonarchy. But like I said, that's the aspirational goal. Realistically, you can start immediately by treating each other fairly and instituting a grassroots revolving door policy for politicians by voting against the incumbent in every office, every election. If and when we get term limits and electoral college reform, then we can start thinking about the utopian stuff. So that's it. Thumbs up and share if you like it, thumbs down if you don't, leave comments, subscribe if you want to hear more or if you just like being triggered, and we'll talk again soon.